China-U.S. relations were far from rosy in 2022, and we can expect 2023 to be pretty much the same, according to many media reports. The biggest challenge, competitor, these are the words we often hear from the U.S. to describe China, and U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken called China the greatest shared strategic challenge facing the United States and its allies this Wednesday, which is 11 days into the new year. Yet, despite much negativity, China's former ambassador to the United States and now Foreign Minister Qing Gang said in a published article that the future of the entire planet depends on a healthy and stable China-U.S. relationship. He also said he left the U.S. more convinced that the door to China-U.S. relations will remain open and cannot be closed. Could he be wrong? Will U.S. policy and attitude toward China go down a rabbit hole in the coming year of the rabbit? I'm pleased to be joined again from Vienna, Austria, by Harvey Zoding, research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization, a think tank. He was political appointee in the Carter administration. Here in the studio, I'm joined by Victor Gao, chair professor at Suzhou University. And uh, gentlemen, welcome to the point. So the U.S. House of Representatives, let's start with the very latest, created the Select Sim Committee on the strategic competition between U.S. and the Chinese Communist Party on Tuesday. It was, a it was an overwhelming vote. All Republicans voted for it. Great majority of Democrats voted for it. Some are saying that, uh, um, you know, it is uh, going to be McCarthyism 2.0. Harvey, how do you see it? Uh, I think with Kevin McCarthy, I think... Uh, we will have McCarthyism 2.0, harking back to this terrible period in American history in the 1950s when a senator from Wisconsin uh, accused uh, many people, mostly falsely, of being communists who had positions in the government. Um, but it's nothing new, and so this is just a continuation. But uh, this combines two elements, uh, sad elements, of American history. One of the elements is how uh, Asian people, specifically Chinese people, were demonized in America and during the period um, after uh, the Civil War, and we call it uh, we call it the Yellow Peril. And then there's the second period later uh, about the Red Peril. So we put those two things together. Um, these are bombshells in Washington, and unfortunately, these days, uh, as I'm sure Victor would agree. The only issue that seems to unite Democrats and Republicans across the aisle in this very fractured government mm -hmm. is uh, demonizing China and trying to encircle China and prevent China's uh, peaceful right. rise. And uh, I think it's a recipe for disaster. Chinese Foreign, Minist Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbing responded on Wednesday saying, we hope the relevant U.S. politicians viewed China and bilateral ties in an objective and reasonable light proceed from the U.S.'s own interests and the common interests of China and the U.S. and head toward the same direction with China and promote the development of uh, China-U.S. relations based on mutual respect, peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation. Victor, you just got back from the United States. How is China going to react to the creation of such committee knowing that a total of six China task forces, so-called, are now operational under the Biden administration. Yes, I just came back from a visit to Washington, D.C. and New York. I'm firmly convinced that in Washington there are very hostile forces against constructive relations between China and the United States. And if you really analyze why there is such a level of hysteria in Washington against China, I think we really need to go to uh, greater depths. Now, does the United States worry that China will steadily continue to develop? If they worry about that, then I think their worries are not only misplaced, and it is really does not serve any constructive purpose for the United States at all. Why? Because China will continue to develop. No force in the world can stop it. Now, does Washington really worry that once China continues to develop, whether China will replace the United States as the next superpower in the world, whether China will squeeze the United States out from the world stage or from the center of the world stage. If they worry about that, 
then this worry will be completely misguided because China will not deal with any other country as if China is above it and China wants to deal with all the countries, including the United States, as an equal. Therefore, I think Washington really need to analyze things in objectivity and in decency rather than see China as an enemy because if they really want to see China as an enemy, then this will really be the end of stability, tranquility in the world. We need to do whatever we can to restore normal relations right. between China and the United States. Nevertheless, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken, as I said at the beginning of the new year, said China is the quote-unquote greatest shared strategic challenge that we, meaning the United States, and our allies and partners face. Uh, Harvey, is such doubt and fear really justifying? What specific measures does the United States intend to take vis-a-vis -vis China in 2023? Can you envision any specific steps for us at this moment? Uh, in terms of very specific, uh, not so much, but I think in terms of uh, a general, that the uh, United States will continue to try to uh, align its allies, uh, whether they're willing allies or not, uh, with their policy of uh, basically economically encircling China. And I believe that they'll ramp up uh, uh, the measures that they've started to take already in terms of denying China uh, various technologies, such as chip technologies uh, and others. And I believe also that there'll be um, a lot uh, more potential confrontation uh, in and around the Taiwan Strait. I think that uh, the freedom of operation, freedom of uh, nav navigation operations are going to continue by the U.S. and its allies. So I think it's going to be uh, more of the same, but just a lot more. All right. And I believe that, I believe that there's a, also uh, an animus for this because now the Democrats have to try to outcompete the crazy Republicans uh, for who uh, wants to bash China more. Victor, from your trip in the United States, what is the point, the focal point of uh, all the voices, you know, hawkish about China? For instance, uh, after the war in Ukraine, we heard a lot of uh, Ukraine today, Taiwan tomorrow. Is that what you're hearing the most at this moment? And uh, what is, 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 is expected under a Republican majority Congress? Well, first of all, if we look at the situation in Washington, the Congress is in a deadlock because of the Republican control of the House of Representatives and the uh, Democratic control of the Senate. That means President Biden's administration for the last two years of his first term will be a lame duck president. Now, this is actually more dangerous for uh, China. Why? Because if the President of the United States really cannot really shape the domestic situations in the United States, he and his administration may actually spend more time on foreign policy and on the military side of the equation. And there is indeed very much of a consensus in Washington between the Republicans as well as the Democrats about anti-China hostility towards China. But I personally believe this kind of hostility is misplaced. When Blinken said China is the fundamental challenge to the United States, what does China challenge the United States about? Does China's steady growth mean a challenge to the United States? If the United States really believes that, then the United States is wrong in its belief. And Beijing and Washington really need to engage each other in a straightforward talk about what does you mean? What do you mean by challenging you? What is the idea of, uh, of the American people that you've met, Victor? How do they feel? about this issue. I mean, um, Minister Ching Gang said that he has the impression that the American people are broad-minded, friendly, and hardworking, and both of these people want uh, a healthy relationship. In terms, of, in terms of that, is the Congress capturing or representing the will of the people, the great majority of them? I don't think this kind of anti-China hostility represents the fundamental interest or the views of the people in the United States. And I completely agree with Foreign Minister uh, Qingang, who was 
uh, when I was in the United States, still the Chinese ambassador there. Now, I visited quite a few uh, drugstores in Washington, in New York, and I still saw many products like thermometer, all kinds of PPT, for example, made in China. It means that the trade and cooperation between China and the United States are not only good for the Chinese people, but definitely good for the American people. So I hope politicians in Washington can really analyze the fundamental interests of the American people and uh, really navigate through China-U.S. relations for the benefit of the American people as well as for the Chinese people. A zero-sum game, a Cold War mentality will not be in the fundamental interest of the American people. Um, Harvey, to wrap up, um, we don't want the tragedy of the Cold War to repeat. Um, it was not good for either, either camp. It was not good for the, for, the, for the whole world. Now, China, in my understanding, is trying to avoid playing the game that the United States is trying to play. Uh, with China trying to show as much sincerity, as much goodwill, uh, can the U.S. really continue with pushing through the, the, the Cold War game that they seem to be playing? I believe, unfortunately, for at least the next two years that they can. And I worry about uh, the presidential elections um, and in two years because uh, it's likely not that Trump will be elected president, but that a Trump with a brain who's much more dangerous, like Mike Pompeo or somebody like that, would be elected. And I think that uh, it, then there would be a in heightened crisis, and I wouldn't want to predict how, how that could go. I think back to the time when uh, President Xi Jinping and uh, President Barack Obama met, and President Xi uh, proposed a new model of great power relations, which basically means that the U.S. and China would work together, that one country doesn't have to be uh, the leader of the world, but this could be a, and should be a shared responsibility. But we're far away from that now. I believe if we could get back to that, I believe if we could reinstitute the strategic and economic dialogues that we used to have that were so fruitful between China and America and discuss issues that mm -hmm. uh, are both All national right. interest to both countries, then okay. we could succeed. All right, we have to leave it there. Many thanks to Harvey Zoding joining us from Vienna, Austria, and Victor Gao joining us here in the studio. With that, we come to the end of this edition of The Point with me, Lu Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Lu Xin in Beijing. On behalf of the whole team, thank you for watching. You've got the point.